Hi, I'm Carlos Lang and welcome to Café con Mezcal. En el episodio de hoy tenemos a Shane Vitali como invitado, genio y CEO detrás de Vitali y Clocks and Colors. Ya sea si te gusta la joyería o te interesa ser bueno vendiendo tus productos, tus proyectos y tus ideas, tienes que escuchar este episodio. Acompáñanos con un café o con un mezcal o mejor con los dos para que veas cómo es que Shane logró transformar una idea en una de las marcas más importantes de joyería del mundo. Muy bonito día. Estamos de regreso en el podcast Café con Mezcal, el podcast donde el café pone la plática y el mezcal la pone mucho mejor. Y el día de hoy tenemos un episodio, un episodio bastante diferente. Tenemos a un gran invitado de nombre Shane Vitali. Y este episodio va a ser total y absolutamente hablado en inglés. Así que si quieren pueden escucharlo en todas sus plataformas de audio. Pero si también quisieran verlo con subtítulos, lo pueden encontrar en todas las otras. YouTube, Instagram y demás. Pero... Um, without further saying in Spanish, I was just saying that uh, welcome to the, uh, the podcast Coffee with Mezcal, where coffee sets out the conversation and Mezcal spikes it up a bit more. <laughs> um, today Hello. we have a very special guest named Shane Vitali. How do you say your last name? Foreign. Foreign. Like a, like a foreign person. Vi <laughs> foreign, yeah, foreign, yeah, yeah. But Vitali is your last name as well? Yeah, I have a complicated family history. I have five names. It's aggressive. I don't know. <laughs> Let me get um, this a little bit closer because we, since Mexico City is very loud, we've gotten these um, microphones too. So we got to get a little bit um, close. Got it. Got it. <laughs> And so, brother, welcome to Mexico. You got in here yesterday. Man, it's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, it, it took me five minutes of being here and I was so excited. It, like, I think this is maybe my third or fourth time in Mexico City. And I love it. There's just such a good energy here. Like, just It's a crazy city you know? for sure. Yeah. You know, I've noticed, um, I was just in Vancouver last week, and I've noticed something very crazy, brother. Throughout one week that I spent in Vancouver and Whistler, I didn't hear one car honk. You're kidding. One. Not one. I mean, people on West Coast Canada are chill. Like, it's, <laughs> it's just a, you know, if you go to Toronto, it's, it's more like New York. It's fast-paced. It's, it's buzzing. You But go to Vancouver, definitely. people are hiking, they're going to bed early, you know, they're uh, More in contact spending time with outside. Is, yeah, it? Is that yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. But, um, It's nice. Is Toronto, Toronto, <laughs> as busy and like crazy and energe energetic as Mexico City, you think? I think I got to spend more time in Mexico City to know. And Mexico City is so massive. Like flying in and out of Mexico City is one of the craziest things to me. Just seeing how enormous it is. Like it... I mean, there's almost as many people in Mexico City as there is in all of Canada. Holy right? crap. Right? Like, that's a crazy that's a thought. Fact. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to compare them. Um, around here, it feels very similar. Do you remember the like first time buzz. that you came to Mexico City? Yep. When was that? Uh, it wasn't long ago. I think it was three and a half, maybe four years ago. Uh, and that was, that was the longest I stay I had here. I was here for almost two weeks, staying in Condesa. And I just remember loving it. I remember feeling really comfortable really quickly. You know, I, I think like in some ways it even reminded me of Toronto. Um, you know, lots of cool little cafes and restaurants and, um, you know, buzzing, but not crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, I'm not really a big New York person, you know, and I know people would kill me for saying that. It's just not really my place. Uh, it's just a little too much, a little too hectic. Um, wow. And you like Mexico City? I don't find Mexico City that crazy. Really? What, what, But maybe what do you I'm think in it's the right, the yeah, right yeah. places, well, you know? Um, I guess that we live here and we get to see it every day. Yeah. Um, I don't think New York is that is as crazy as it is here. I was listening to Joe Rogan podcast maybe a couple of years ago. He was saying that in many places in Mexico City, he didn't even see like street signs. I was like, what? Like what part of Mexico City did you see? You know, so you start to create like a whole... Imagine how many people listen to that. So that a lot of people heard about that. And then a lot of people think Mexico City is crazy and crazier and crazier. And I guess it just echoes, you know? Yeah, I often tell people that Mexico City is one of my favorite cities. And they're always shocked. That, you know, because what people hear, you know, especially up in Canada, it's, it's just so different than the reality. You know, like to me, it's a vibrant, bustling mega city. You know, like it's, a, I don't know. I really like it here. It's like a crazy city. I can see myself city. living here for sure. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. It'd be amazing to have you over here, brother. And you know something I've noticed throughout the pandemic, since we never cl shut down our borders or anything, and you could come here, like even if you had like COVID, I guess, you could just walk in through this country. 
I've noticed so many, so many people from all over the world are coming over, like yep. models, photographer, artists, like walk down the street and like it's a lot of foreign people. So I guess this, the, what you're saying, like this energetic thing, which it's, it, it's, it's such a part of us, you know? For it's, sure. It's bringing people over. I know a lot of people that have landed here and just aren't leaving. And I get it, you know, they, they want that freedom. Um, you know, and a lot of these people are people who are really into their health and, um, y you know, they feel comfortable in their own skin. They're not scared or concerned about COVID. So they come here and they're like, you know, I can stick to my normal routines. Yeah, I can still go to the gym. I can, you know, still be outside and, you know, feel like life is pretty normal. So I get the attraction. Did you come through the pandemics? I did, yeah. That's yeah, I, crazy. I was here for five weeks last winter. Um, and then I've been here for about a month now. That's insane because um, back in the pandemic, which we still, I think, are, I don't know. Um, so many people got locked down in their homes, scared as heck. And then people like you, wild travelers, just like decided, yeah, I'm, I'm healthy with my, my own body. I, I eat well, I, I work out. I'm gonna go to a crazy country and just keep it, keep exploring. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, I had my own kind of concerns or fears like anybody else. Um, and I've had quite a few issues with my immune system. I won't get into it, but I was, you know, a little bit concerned because of that, but I got it and you I didn't even COVID. have any symptoms. I've had it twice now. And the first time I had no symptoms. So after I had it, I was like, well, I might, might as, well as well go well. travel. <laughs> you know, I, I think I have a, a free card now to travel. And, uh, you know, I've since again, like I said, had it again that time I had sniffles. So, you know, I've been lucky and you know, generally I, I'm a pretty healthy person. So figured why not take advantage of that? But I understand people, you know, being concerned and, and you know, playing it safe. But for me, it just seemed like an opportunity to That's go amazing. enjoy life. That's yeah. crazy. That's a, the same way we saw it, I think. Um, and and it, was, it was fun to go out in the world and, and like so many streets were empty. You'd get to see places you couldn't see before. But um, I'm amazed. Um, I, I didn't say this at the beginning, but you're the owner and CEO uh, and, and part owner with, with some other um, investors or partners of three huge brands <laughs> besides many other businesses that you're running. So how do you manage to travel so much and to just say, I wasn't planning to be in Mexico City, then again, you're here. Like, how do you have such a huge infrastructure and, and companies and, and still manage to go on the world? Yeah, I mean, I. For one thing, I don't think it's that huge. I appreciate it. I mean, it's it's a good sized business. I'm proud of it. I'm happy with where it's at, but it's not that crazy. Um, but you know, I think first of all, I have to just thank the team. Like we have an incredible team that I trust, and I don't feel like I need to be you know breathing over their shoulder and micromanaging them. Um, so I mean, that's a huge part about it, or part of it. Sorry, but beyond that, it was really important to me from the start. Like I, I've always wanted to be able to travel and, and kind of work remotely. So we kind of set the company up for that. Um, I was never into having set hours for the office. I was never into, you know, telling people that they should always be working from the office, et cetera, because I didn't want to do things that way. So, you know, at the end of the day, I can do 99% of my job from my computer. Um, once in a while, it's important to be in the office to, you know, FaceTime is important, you know, like even just sitting down yeah, and chatting so, like this, it's right? It's so crazy. Like, FaceTime, like literal FaceTime, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> true, not, true I, FaceTime. Man, video calls are <laughs> driving me crazy at this point. To be fair, but, but yeah, I mean, it's important to get FaceTime from time to time, especially when you're brainstorming. There's an energy that you can't really share when you're, you know, doing things remotely. Um, and I need to physically feel and see samples. So, you know, I time things to make sure I can do that as well. But otherwise you know, most of my job is just emails and Slack and I really don't need to be anywhere in particular for that. Right. That's insane. So I stay on top of it. So whenever you're traveling, do you set out a sort of um, schedule or you just wake up early or give me like a, yeah, I still just work way too much. Honestly, it, it, <laughs> it's this weird thing where like, yeah, I'm fortunate. I travel a lot and I'm not complaining. Uh, and I get to work from a lot of great places, but it's not like I'm on vacation. Like a lot of people are like, Oh, enjoy your vacation. It's like, yeah, I mean, I still work 60 hours, you know, <laughs> like um, 60 hours a week. Yeah, I mean, I'm right now I'm supposed to be on sabbatical and I'm still probably working like 40, you know, like I'm supposed <laughs> to be not working at all. Like a, that was my mission in life was to just take a huge step back and take a break. Um, but it's OK. Like we've got a ton of really cool stuff going on, so I'm pretty happy to be working and I like what I do. Right. So um, not the end of the world, but 
you know, when I am in a lot of these places, you know, if I'm lucky, I get to go out for a nice meal here and there, or like, you know, maybe get to do something on the weekend, but it's not as if like I spend the days exploring. So I've been a lot of cool places where people are like, Oh, have you done this? Did you do that? Did you do this? I'm like, uh, but the, do get you there. get that craving or no? Sometimes for it sure. It sucks because a lot of people tell you like, you should be doing this. Oh, yeah. I, you, you didn't see that. Come yeah. on. And you're like, yes, but I'm also working, you know? Exactly. How, so, do you, how do you control that? I mean, at the end of the day, I think I just got to take stock in how many things I have been able to do. Right. Like, okay. Yeah. I didn't see everything in that one place, but I've been to, you know, countless places and I've got a good taste of those places. The other thing too, is the way that I travel and, and kind of have as long as I can remember is it's way more around just experiencing the culture. Like for me, for f one thing, food is huge for me. Um, you know, so just making sure that I'm always kind of going out and exploring and eating good food and, and you know, tasting the local uh, kind of delicacies, that kind of thing. Um, and then I just get a lot from just walking around. Like I pick a neighborhood and I just cruise around and I can do that anytime. But you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, have you seen this? Have you done that? And it's very kind of touristic type things. And usually the answer is no. It's like, the hype sucks, I haven't really. But I don't, yeah, I don't really care about seeing shit. Yeah, you yeah. know, like for me, it's like, cool, I saw it. I could have looked thing. at a photo of that, you know? It didn't, it doesn't feel like an experience yes. to me. You know, like, you know, everybody has to go to the Eiffel Tower. I'm like, why? Yeah, why? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. that did nothing for me. Yeah, you, know? yeah. you can so, find more magic somewhere else besides the Infinite Eiffel Tower. Yeah. yeah, and you know what? I think um, it's a huge part of um, what social media has done to us. I've noticed so many people, so many places here like burn out just because like they had good Instagram posts, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then again, you get there because you want to try the good food and then it's a huge line, you know, the hype sucks. How many people do you meet these days and think to yourself, does this person even like traveling or are they just doing this for the gram? Right? <laughs> like I think it's more than not. I honestly think it's more than not. Holy shit. You know, people just like building these checklists of photos like, okay, I was here and then they're out. And I'm like, did you have any fun? Did you enjoy Holy any fuck. of that? You know? Brother, when do you think um, it became more attractive to share your life than to live it? I mean, since Instagram really proliferated, like I think it's all, I mean, it, it certainly started with Facebook, but I think it like, I think the kind of like the death punch was Instagram for sure. Um, I do think it's chilling out though. Like I, I'm seeing more and more <laughs> people, people back, yeah. relax and you know, more and more people not really posting anymore, etc. cetera, um, using it for different reasons, which I think is a good thing, but it's still all too often that I see people just glued to their phone. Like, you know, you get to a really beautiful place and every single person there is just holding their phone, snapping a hundred photos. And I'm like, did they even look at it without the screen? And if not, what's the point, you know, because you could have looked at it on that screen from anywhere in the world. Like true. that trips me Very out, true. You know? Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could, um, travel to all these places, see all these photographs from your house. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so not a scorecard though. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, not. And that's what it feels like. Same for, you know, people kind of ticking off how many countries they've been to, you know, like the, the tally I'm sitting here, like I've been back to certain countries more times than I can count because I love them. Like, yeah, yeah, I could go and like tick something off, but what's the point of the scorecard? You know? True. So if you don't count places, if you don't count um, countries, what do you count? It's a good question. When it comes to traveling, I don't think I count that much. The closest thing I've done to counting was very recent because um, I've always had this idea that I would split my time throughout the year in different places, kind of my favorite places. So I've been trying to take a kind of high level, you know, like pulled back look at all the places I've been that I really love and then evaluate them, you know, somewhat quantitatively so I can think, okay, you know, I liked these places. I felt really good in them, but you know, how would they work for my lifestyle? So I, I made this huge list and then I was like, okay, here's all the things I'd love to do. And then I listed out the places I like, and then I gave a point for everything that I'd like to do that I can do in one of those places. And interestingly, from that huge list, Whistler came out number one by far because there's just so many activities you can do in Whistler really easily, like right out your door, right? Um, that's when I was telling you, I was like, okay, I think, I think I'm gonna get a place in Whistler, even though it's obscenely expensive because 
it's where I would be happiest, you know? Damn. You yeah. should do that, brother. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'd come over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not getting to play some Whistler without a spare bedroom, you know? <laughs> so sick. Um, I don't want to... I love what we're talking about, but I would love to uh, bring back traveling later on. I want to start in the beginning. Okay. Like, um, you're a designer, you are a creative, you do many things nowadays with all the brands that you're working on. Um, three brands, you would say? Yeah, three brands. So yeah, it's about to launch a fourth, though. Vitali. How do you say Vitali? Vitali. Vitali. Yeah. Um, Clocks and Colors. Yep. And Ita. At a Love. Yeah. At a Love. Yeah. Good. So how, how how did it start? Like, were you a little kid, like very creative? Um, uh, I've always been creative for sure. I think that that's, you know, one of my kind of superpowers. Um, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with Lego and I was always building different things out of Lego and then entering into competitions and you know, I'd, I'd win these Lego contests and then there's, I'd get more free Lego. Lego. There was when I was a kid. I would imagine they're still out there. Um, and I was determined to be a designer for Lego. Like that's what I thought I'd do when I was, when I was a little kid, you know? And then as I got older, I started thinking, well, maybe not Lego, but I'm going to design things and sell them to people. I found this thing that I, I wrote when I was in grade six. It's pretty funny. I posted it. I found it, it and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I just said something along the lines of when I'm older, I'm going to find a career where I can design things and sell them to people. Um, and I forgot about that, you know, but I think it was always in the back of my head. Um, and then my creativity kind of started moving towards music. Um, got really, really into music through high school and was playing in punk bands and metal bands. And really, as a secondary, like as a byproduct of being into music, I started really expressing myself with fashion. I didn't realize it though. Like when I ended up working in fashion, my friends were less surprised than I was because I never thought of myself as a person into fashion. And they were like, dude, you've always been into it. Like, what are you talking about? And, and looking back, I'm like, oh yeah, that's so, so obvious. You <laughs> it's know? just a part of it that you don't realize it. Yeah, I didn't you even just think live about it. it. Yeah, I just yeah. did it and I, I loved it and I was super attracted to you know, all the different ways you could express yourself with your style. Um, like I still remember buying women's jeans because you couldn't get skinny jeans yet Holy for men. Holy crap, I did the same thing in you LA. You did that? The same thing, yeah. brother. And you couldn't the, get them. You couldn't get them and yeah. it sucked because um, women's jeans, they have very small pockets. <laughs> So we Absolutely. couldn't even fit anything on them. I have a funny story. So <laughs> this one time I went to buy women's jeans and obviously it's embarrassing and awkward and you're not going to try them on, right? So I go, I go to buy them and I just grab them quickly. I don't look at the whole thing. And I get them home and the back pocket on one of the jeans is a rainbow. And I was oh, like, fuck. okay, like I, I can't, you know, like I'm like 15 at this time. I'm like, I don't, I don't have the balls to, to rock that, you know? <laughs> so, so I cut the pocket off. And I played in a local band that was like somewhat popular. And it was funny because over the next like few months, I started seeing more and more people just cut the back pocket off. Like it was some sort of fashion statement. And I just did it out, seemingly out of necessity. Like the I felt like pocket. I had to. Yeah. You cut out the I whole just pocket? cut out the pocket. And you would so leave you could like just the see strings. like the line. Yeah. Um, and then kids around me started doing it. And I remember my mom brought this up later on. And she was like, look, you've always been into like setting style trends and stuff. And I was like, well, that was not my intention you know you're so <laughs> humble brother i love it no it, it was not my intention of course, it was of just course. like it, accidental. it never is i guess and whenever it is it just goes sideways Maybe. yeah yeah you can't force a lot of these mm -hmm. things right like people people definitely pick up on that too like when you're trying too hard mm -hmm. um you know and you see it all the time like where people are like really really trying to be cool and it's like hey man like dial it back, you know? <laughs> dial it back. Like, so you're in high school yeah um you're with music you're playing like rock Yep. Or what kind of music like were you really playing? Like really heavy, really heavy metal stuff. Like, like which bands did you listen uh, to? What I was inspired by wasn't necessarily what I was capable of playing, but like bands that I was really into at the time were like Every Time I Die, uh, Cancer Bats, stuff like that Very, had a really heavy Southern yeah. metal sound to it. Maybe like Pantera for kind of like a bigger name, but a little bit more modern version of Pantera. So... Yeah, I was really into that kind of stuff, like really, really loud. And I would play very heavy guitar and I'd just scream. Um, Whenever you were in high school, were you um, still had in mind like Lego designing or was that back in? No, that stuff kind of disappeared. Because what happened, I, I got to high school and I'm colorblind. So when I got to high completely school, completely colorblind, I'm red green, but it's pretty bad. Holy shit. Um, so you'll very rarely see me wear color. And if I do, it's everything else is black or white because I don't know how to mix them. Um, but because of that, when I was in high school, they told me not to take art classes, which is ridiculous. Looking back, that's such a silly thing, but I was told not to take art. So I, it was like I didn't ever really pursue the, like visual creative stuff. So it was just music. Um, 
And then I ended up falling into doing kind of more visual stuff again after university. Uh, Because what happened, so after university, I went backpacking. I was in Bali um, and I saw people making jewelry. And I'd seen women wear two finger rings. Um, and I was like, you know, I two wonder, finger rings? yeah, what like, like a, a ring that like goes across two fingers okay, kind of yeah. thing. Um, but you know, they would just have silly sayings on them, whatever. And like YOLO. Yeah. YOLO <laughs> or like booty or something, you know, and it wasn't something I was going to wear. And, uh, so I, I just drew something really terrible and had somebody make it for me and it was brutal. In Bali? Yeah. In Bali. You drew it and you made it in Bali. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, I was planning to just get something quickly made for myself and, I, after doing that, like after seeing that first sample, which only took a couple days, I was immediately hooked. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like the, the design was horrible. The product was horrible, but the fact that I had this idea and it became this tangible thing, yes. I was addicted instantly, which, you know, you and I were chatting before we started uh, the podcast today about some of the products you're working on. And I was saying like, how addictive is that? Right. That I'm completely obsessed now. And I, I apply it to literally everything in my life. Like if I can customize it, I'm customizing it, you know, and, and I love all the things you can customize motorcycles, like, you know, old cars, houses, like, you know, anything where you can really put your own flair into it. Um, and so, yeah, I was just hooked and, and it never stopped from there. Like I just kept making more and more products. But, um, what did you study in, in university? Because I think it's different than it. I don't know how it, how it is in, in Canada, but, um, in Mexico, you have to choose what you're going to be doing oh, whenever yeah, yeah. you yeah, do you the choose. same thing over there. Yeah. Yeah. So in university, I studied politics, political science. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a pretty political person, actually. Um, you know, I try, I try not to be like too aggressive with it, etc. cetera. But um, yeah, politics are really important to me. Um, not the way that they happen in today's world. In fact, it disgusts me. But um, you know, I think it's a really important thing. So I was very, very into it. And like through high school, I was very into punk rock music, right? And punk rock yeah, is rooted in definitely. very political messages. Um, and that inspired me to go into politics. Um, but by third year, I was getting really frustrated with the idea of studying politics. And I also became very aware that politicians are really not the ones pulling the strings. It's business people. And they're the ones who can really make a difference in the world. Um, so I started, started studying marketing. And I kind of always knew that I should work for myself. Like I was not a person that was going to do well working, you know, up a corporate ladder. Um, I'm just too like set and like, I, I want to do things my way, you know, like I kind of need to lead. I'm too like, I guess, a type, um, you know, and a lot of people say a type is a bad thing. I guess you can have your opinion on that. I, I don't necessarily think so. I think it can be, but, um, yeah. So, you know, I knew myself, I knew I needed to go that direction. So I started studying marketing. So I finished uh, university, both with a politics and marketing degree. Um, you and get then, two degrees or it's the same mixed one? They call it a double major. Wow. Yeah. So it's kind of like you have two. Um, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. Like it, a couple more courses and you can do it. Um, but yeah, I just kind of knew that politics wasn't going to be the right path for me. It was interesting studying it. Um, you know, while I was studying it, I was a very good speaker and, and very good writer. That's since fallen away That's a little bit. Insane. But <laughs> That's insane. That's insane. Wow. That's a, like, imagine if you would have gone on that side everything would have been so different. But um, did you ever have the chance to work in a office like marketing or? Yeah, so right when I finished university, um, I went backpacking. And then when I got back from that, I took the last few grand I had, I put it all into making inventory for the first Vitaly products. And then when I moved into my mom's basement, like that classic story, because I didn't have a cent to live anymore. Um, but you spent all the money on Yeah, I, I, I had like $3,000 left to my name and I spent it all on inventory. Um, so I moved into my mom's basement and within a few months I got this job. It's a really, really good job and I'm still friends with the guy that hired me and everything. Um, but it was a, a director of sales for this media agency. So it was kind of like an entry into you know, marketing and sales and business. Um, and I learned quite a bit there, but I did that for about a year while also working on my business. So I'd work there like, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. Then I'd go home and work like eight hours and then go to bed. Um, and it just, after about a year, I was just taxed. So I had to make the decision uh, and I quit that job and went full time on my business. And people thought I was crazy. They're like, what the hell are you doing? Like, it was a really good job, especially for my age and out of, out like of school. Like well paid, you had a nice yeah. office. Yeah, exactly. You could, you could grow, you had the future set out for yourself, right? Yeah, in theory, like it, it looked really, really good for me. Like you know, if I wanted to go that classic career route and, you know, once I started doing my business, I took like an 80% pay cut, you know, Holy and crap. I did that for three or four years before we could even start to pay ourselves a little bit more. Um, it's funny cause I had several good friends 
and they, they had the best intentions, like literally sit me down and be like, Hey man, you shouldn't do, you know, that. maybe it's time to move on, you know, like actually just being like, I don't, so there's, there's actually a running joke with some of my friends now they'll, they'll like, we'll all be out or something. They're like, Hey Shane, you still doing that ring thing? <laughs> <laughs> like, and yeah. they're wearing the ring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so cool, brother. But, um, I want to go back a little bit more. So when did you choose the name? How did, um, so you made this, this, this piece in, in Bali yep. and you already knew it was going to be called Vitali. No, I had no idea. So it, I feel really fortunate because the way that my business started was so natural and organic. Like I, w I really was not trying to start a business. You know, you talk to a lot of people and they're like, oh, you know, I did this big business plan and I'm going to go out and raise capital and blah, blah, blah. And they've got this vision. I didn't have that at first. I literally was just trying to make cool stuff. Um, and I thought, okay, maybe I can make enough of these to pay for another backpacking trip. So like my initial goal was like, maybe I could make $8,000 because that's what I spent to my first backpacking trip. Um, and then I just kind of kept moving the goalpost when I saw that it was starting to work and when I realized I was really enjoying doing it. Um, but the name was kind of out of necessity. So what happened was I was in this store on Queen Street, which is kind of like, you know, I don't know, maybe that's comparable Toronto? to, yeah, in Toronto, it's maybe like comparable to Condesa or something. Um, you know, a little bit more of like, kind of like a hip area. And uh, I go into this store and I know that the owner is in there and I had some of the samples of the original rings and I just asked the owner, like, is this something that you'd ever want in your store? Not expecting anything. Like I wasn't, it was more like you could call like it market research. research. You, you yeah, could call yeah, it yeah. that, but it was more just like curiosity. I happened to be in there, happened to know she was the owner. It wasn't like I was trying to do anything. I had no idea how wholesale worked or anything around that business. And she was like, yeah, I'll buy whatever you have. And she bought all the samples that I had. Um, you and just she, showed up to ask her? Yeah. Just out of curiosity. And she took all of them. She took all of them. I had, I had like 12 or 13. It wasn't crazy, What? you know, but to me it was crazy. Of course it was. And that's when I was like, okay, I think I'm on to something, you know? Like but was that the two? The two uh, finger rings. Two finger rings. So initially I did all two and three finger rings and I thought that that's why people were buying it. You know, I just thought, oh, you know, it's this kind of niche thing. It'll be cool for a little bit and then it'll go out of style. And that's fine. You know, like I'll be able to, I'll, be able to pay for a backpacking trip or something. But when she bought those from me, she was like, so what's it called? Like, what are your prices? And I was like, I haven't thought about any of this stuff. Um, and that night I was like looking at my arm and I have Vitaly tattooed on me. Um, and I was like, well, it's kind of a cool name. Like, why don't I just call it Vitaly? And it's easy. Like I knew from business class and stuff that using your own name, you don't have to think about like trademark rules and stuff. You're allowed to use it when it's your own name. So I was like, okay, well, let's just do this. <laughs> And it Easy. all worked out so well. It worked out. Yeah. And it's crazy because I'm, I don't want to go too ahead with clocks and colors, but Vitali, it's so different. It's so, it's more of a fashion brand, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's interesting because we've been having a conversation internally and I don't even know if they'd like that I'm chatting about this, so I won't go too into detail, but it's evolved so, so, so much from when I started it. Um, you know, and transparently, I started Vitali and then about three years later, I started Clocks and Colors. And Clocks and Colors was started because my roots have always been rock and roll and tattoo Biker. culture and yeah and, and i always wanted to get into motorcycles which i since have for many years um and i wanted a brand that really reflected that part of my dna and my culture um and so you know i, I started kind of growing them in tandem but clocks was always the one that was m most authentic to my identity but we hired our very first hire is still with us and he's the creative director for the company but his focus is Vitaly and that brand is very much his vision. Um, so I credit him with his name is Zach Vitiello. He's a genius and, and incredible photographer and, and creative, just all things creative. He's a master of, um, and he took that brand to where it is today. Um, which I would argue is very much an actual fashion brand. Now it's just an affordable one. Um, you know, I think they're struggling to define where it exists in the world because it's price points are so fair but it's presented in my opinion as like a straight up capital, like capital F fashion brand, you know, which is cool. That's not really my world. So it's hard for me to contribute more than just towards the product. So I have a lot of insight on the physical product because it's just, that's my thing. Um, but outside of that, my focus is more on the clocks and colors brand and the add love brand because those are more in my universe. But are you still designing for Vitali or not so much? So my role is kind of, across all the brands now when it comes to product is 
we call it like executive creative director, but really I oversee all the product. Um, but we have a head designer now for the Vitaly brand mm-hmm. and we have a kind of a team of designers for clocks and colors and out of love. Um, when it comes to clocks, I will basically come up with a theme or a concept and then I'll be like, here's a bunch of things that I want to see happen, etc. They start bringing me a bunch of designs and then I kind of ruthlessly like pick them apart and carve them down. Um, when it comes to Vitaly at this point, they pretty much will present me with almost a finished collection and they'll be like, what do you think? And, and I kind of like put the final touches on it. Um, I can be a little bit, you know, harsh when it comes to product. And I think it's just kind of that necessary final touch. But in general, I'm pretty stepped back from that brand now. Like they're just doing an amazing job with it. So I just support where I can. Um, That's something, this is so mystical, brother. Like welcome to Mexico, <laughs> yeah, brother. Feels like a very authentic <laughs> we should experience. actually <laughs> step it up and try co- coffee with mezcal. Are you down? Down. I've never had coffee with mezcal, so I'm kind of fired up for we this. We didn't have that in Oaxaca. No, I we did not. So. No, because no, no, I wasn't no, no, really no. drinking, remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Si, si, hello, el cafecito viejo. So, brother, um, I don't know if you met my good friend Oaxacan, Omar. I don't think Maybe so. not. But maybe, I think he was very busy and we were all over the place in Oaxaca. But yeah. he's like Oaxacan. Yeah. He, he's, his name is behind um, talking, walking. You know, like a, if it was like a verb, like going around in Oaxaca. So, he brought us the best mezcal from Oaxaca. Nice. Like, whenever you I don't love see, it. It's just like water yes, bottles. Yes. It. Whenever you don't see like a proper label, that's yeah. the best mezcal. <laughs> and it comes from all over the place, brother. But since we're going to go on coffee with mezcal, we're going to go on espadín, which is the, the one that's got the least amount of alcohol. Espadín? Espadín. This is the most okay. common. Yeah, yeah. This is. I brought home a bottle of Espadine from when we were in Oaxaca last time. Which uh, did you remember? It was from which that brand? really, really beautiful place that you took us oh, to. Oh, Amantes. Oh man, that place was. You know, you talk like traveling. We were talking about all these. Like, that was a memorable experience for me. You know, that place was magical. Mm. That whole weekend, like, I'm so grateful that you know you planned out that whole weekend because it was amazing and. You know, I didn't feel like we did a bunch of touristy things, you know. We, went, we did not, brother. Exactly. We went off the and I loved that. Sure. And I remember uh-huh. being at your friend's art gallery. Like, that was so cool. And, mm-hmm. like, you know, those experiences are the ones that I remember. Um, but that, that, what, what, I apologize. What do you call the Mezcal factories again? Um, Palenque. Palenque? Palenque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Palenque. Um, yeah. Palenque de Amantes. Yeah, yeah. That place... Man, just the architecture, everything was just incredible there, right? The setting, like where it was placed. And like we were just there chilling, just drinking, just talking about life, brother. It was a quite a, quite a, and that's how we met. Yeah. Pretty much. Like you said, I'm going to Oaxaca. I was like, oh shit, I need to put something special for for you and your homies. Dude, Oaxaca is like, even like, I think most of the things that are here are from Oaxaca. The coffee is from Oaxaca. The mezcal is from Oaxaca. I think, um... I don't know. I, I keep saying it, but maybe in my other life I was Oaxacan. Like, <laughs> there's something that I'm I'm very drawn about that place. You know, it's an amazing place. I I there's a lot of places I really love, and I don't know how to always explain why. And this will sound really woo woo. Like I don't like to speak this way, but it's the only way I can describe it. I find some places just have a different energy. You know, like I feel like there's an energy in a place. I don't know how else to describe it. And Oaxaca had a really good one. I feel the same way about Mexico City. I feel the same way about like Florence, Italy, um, parts of Bali. You know, like there's just places where I just feel like the energy is right. You know? Awesome. Yeah. Brother, I, I want you to, to try it first. Cool. Salud. Salud. As I told you before we were filming, I'm going to ask you what you think about like the stuff that we're making. It'd be an honor for you to, you have to like um, score it. Oh, gracias. This is just like a small sip, so you can like try it. Smooth. Oh yeah, very. It was interesting. I, I really like it. The the initial taste <laughs> almost gave me like I don't know how to describe it. Like it almost gave me like caramel notes, like what you would expect more from like a bourbon or something, which is really cool. I don't yeah, think I've yeah. ever had that from a mezcal. That's crazy because bourbon, you can get that because it's in the wooden crates for a long time. So it absorbs How that taste. How is this one made? Is it made with wood or something? No, not at all. May- maybe just a couple of days when it's fermenting, but not right. at all. Like I taste some of that though. It tastes maybe it's very maybe natural. It's because I had it right after the coffee. True, very true. I don't know, it could be that. So 
we actually designed this with a maestro oh, cool. from Pitao Copicha. And the whole idea, it's like how, okay, I want to be like pitching you the idea. It's how like whenever you drink mezcal, it can go from here, from here to here. <laughs> Like a mystical thing, you know, like you can also like put them down. Like if you're drinking too, like you can like, okay, this is, this is the mild one and this is a strong one. I feel like you can go from here to here when I'm drinking bourbon. <laughs> Not with mezcal. You drink, you drink too much bourbon and like you can turn into a monster. Mezcal, I'm, I usually... It's, it's, it's a... I was talking about uh, that with the musician. He was telling me there's no evil involved in mezcal. Yeah. It's a very solid... You know who made it. You know there's no conserv um, conser how, how, conservatives. conservatives. Does that make sense? Like not know. fake stuff that will make the oh, the preservatives. product preservatives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Make, make it last longer. Yeah, conservatives are other thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have your coffee there. Got it. Decaf, so we don't get too crazy. <laughs> and this is supposed to be just like a spike. Is you're you're not hot in this jacket. It's so nice. I am. But it, I am. It looks but, but I'm yeah. saving uh, for a surprise for you. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> All right. And what should I get? Picking yours? I don't even want to see what time it is. Yeah, who cares? Tienes otro cafecito por ahí, viejo? Que me eches? No, I'm going to go coffee with mezcal with you. What episode is this, by the way? How many of you Number? Now? Yeah. This week? No, 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 total, total. I would say somewhere around 25, 30. Nice. We would, ra we would much rather um, make every conversation last forever instead of making, oh, with this, with that, with that, you know? Yeah. Like, I want you to see this episode in like five, 10 years and still be like, yeah, that's a solid picture of who I was that yeah. time, you know? So I want to tell you something that I've noticed very cool. Um, I've met up with a lot of musicians which I admired their, their music. And whenever I met them, I was like, if I used to be a fan of their work, now I am way more. Right. Because I, I, I get to meet the, the person you know, who's involved on, on the whole philosophy that's behind the, the, the brand. And that same thing happened with me. Like, I used to be a fan uh, of Clocks and Colors, but when I met you, I was like, this guy is Clocks and Colors. <laughs> and I like Thank the you. brand way more, and I think it's gotten in my head that... um. It's such a successful and beautiful and well forged brand because it is who you are. You're a biker, you're a badass, and you you made all that into a brand, right? I appreciate it. I don't really think I'm a badass, but which is this. No, I, I appreciate that though. I mean, that's my goal with this brand. It's you know, to keep it as authentic to myself as possible and you know, I, I really want it to live on like it's the brand that I see myself, you know, continuing to build for another decade, another two decades. Um, and I think the only way that something like that lasts is if it stays authentic and, authentic. and true to you. So obviously, you know, I'm still a business guy. I still want to see it grow. Um, so that can be challenging. You're, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's like, it's kind of like this cup, you know, you've got like, you know, if the skull's the business side and, and your face, <laughs> you're kind of always trying to balance those two things. Um, and that can be tricky. Like I never, ever want this brand to feel like it's sold out. Um, and you know, so that's kind of always this like internal battle, but I think as long as I go back to it and think, do I genuinely like this? Like, would I wear this? Is this something I'm excited about? Or I think it, I think it's good. Yeah. And if it's not, you drop it. Yeah. Oh, this is, hold on. This is too much. <laughs> okay. So it started off with jewelry and then it became like a clothing brand as well, right? Yeah, we're doing some apparel for sure. <laughs> Honestly, the, the funny thing is with, with the apparel side of things, so Vitaly used to have a full apparel line, right? Um, and what we realized was apparel moves at a very different pace typically than jewelry. It's, it takes a lot longer to make it happen. It, especially with Vitaly apparel, that, that brand is, is very fashion forward, right? So the you style to had to change and really and fast. All the time. Exactly, it's always wow. changing. Whereas with Clocks and Colors, it's a very classic style, right? Like I've, I've been wearing black band tees, you know, motorcycle shirts, that kind of thing, since I was like 16 years old. True. Or younger. Um, and it's still kind of there, right? So we 
did apparel with Vitaly and then we realized that jewelry was really what we're skilled at and it's what we started with and we were like, look, I think we need to focus. Um, so we pulled out of apparel and put everything we had into jewelry and it was absolutely the best decision. Like it's improved massively. So and, and you went the other way around with clocks and colors, right? Yeah, so with clocks and colors, when we started doing apparel, to be totally honest, it was because people were just asking for something that they could wear with our logo. So, you know, people that just wanted to rock the brand or like, you know, bands that are into it, etc. So we were just like, you know, why don't we just print on some blanks and, and see what happens? Um, and we figured, you know, if we're printing on blanks for these people, why not just put them up on the website? And it started to sell really well. Like it's, it's still, you know, nowhere near what the jewelry is and it's never going to get transparently it's never going to get the attention that the jewelry does or the sunglasses because sunglasses are becoming a huge thing there's something i'm really really excited about and proud of um but you know it's it's really starting to move but because of that you know i have this philosophy of always trying to improve things like i, I always want our products to get better and better and better you know and some people say that like you know sales pitch kind of thing but i really believe that so you're going to see a really huge change to our apparel soon um so it's still going to be classic it's still going to be blanks etc um, but I'm having a fabric designed for us right now um, that will make all the garments technical. So what I mean by that is all of the garments will actually function in a way that you could wear it to the gym or to a concert or whatever, and it's still going to have that same quality. You know, so it'll be like antimicrobial, it'll be anti-wrinkle, um, wow, sweat so wicking. Wow, very good quality stuff. Exactly. Very, like, extremely high quality stuff, but it'll still look like this. You'll still have that very classic look. But for me, I was like, look, if I'm going to keep producing apparel, I want it to align with our ethos, you know, which is to really create the best products. Um, so I'm pretty fired up about that. So we've, we've, got, we've got that coming. It's going to take some time. Um, but it's gonna be really cool. That's insane. Tell me what you thought about the c coffee. Yeah, mascara. I'm obsessed. Like, Did you like uh, it? Yeah, I've taken no. a few sips already. I've never tried this, and it's amazing. You were lying to so, me. So uh, I swear, a lot of people do it with bourbon back home, right? Like you, bourbon and coffee. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really common, and I've What's had that, that called? a million times. I'm gonna. I, I don't think this is right. It maybe a hot toddy. I should know what it's called. I'm completely blanking on it. No, hot toddy's with like cider or something. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, but this is better. Way better, actually. So. And it tastes like they, they were meant to be together, right? I honestly, when you first mentioned it, I was like, okay, man, like I'll, I'll try, I'll try I anything guess. once, you know, <laughs> like I, was like, I don't really see it. Then I took the sip and I was like, Holy all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Brother, hopefully I'll go, we'll go back to the video and see your face because I, I didn't get to see it. I love seeing it because everyone <laughs> trips out about it. It's like two things that you would never. I would have never mixed them. Yeah, yeah. It's really good. And then you drink it and it's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Speaking of mezcal, I need to come home with a couple good bottles. Oh, I'll help you out. Yeah, I gotta make sure, sure I do that for sure. Yeah. So, um, back to clocks and colors. I'm amazed by the, all the crazy different things that you have put together. Like you have flasks, you have boxing gloves, you have um, dice. It's so fun, man. Like <laughs> it. It's honestly as simple as I just think about something I want. And I'm like, something shit, let's make want. this. It's always just something I want. Yeah, so like the boxing bags and boxing gloves were because I had just started boxing. And I, I had a boxing bag in my home gym and it was ugly as hell. It was like blue and sporty looking. And I'm like, I don't want this in my home. You know, like this, this is not my style. Like That's the boxing insane. bags we made, you could hang it right in here, you know, and it, it, it would, would look fit? cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely would, you know, but it would work, right? With all uh -huh, your like warm definitely, leathers definitely. and that kind of thing. And, and so that's what I wanted. I was like, I want something that fits me aesthetically um and that's where all these things come from that's how we started doing sunglasses too like i've i've always loved eyewear like i just think it's a really really cool tool for expression and and from the perspective of a designer there's so much you can do like there's just so much room to be creative with sunglasses and i feel like it's one of the least creative spaces and i mean of course there's exceptions to that i'm not trying to like call out every brand ever or something like Uh, like Retro Super Future do a yeah, really cool course. job. Mike Keaton. Um, Monster. Or, is it Monster? I for sure just butchered that. I can't. I'm blanking <laughs> on who I'm talking about right now. Uh, regardless, there's some really great brands out there for sure. Um, but it just felt like there was not as much exploration as there could be. So we've been diving into it like head first. I'm stoked. I'll show you some renderings later of what's coming. But it's, it's fun, man. Like it's really cool. That's like, what so you can crazy, do. brother, because you were doing so well with Silver. And then you just decided, okay, so I, I would love to have this. I'm going to make it for the brand. And it also succeeded. Yeah, I think we've just kind of pivoted a little bit from 
jewelry and we've kind of positioned ourselves more as accessories like the stuff that completes your outfit you know yeah okay we've got some t-shirts and some hoodies and stuff but like we're not going to be an apparel brand i say that but we are working on some leather jackets um <laughs> and they're, they're they're pretty rad um but again it's not like we're not trying to build out a leather jacket portion etc we're planning to open retail stores uh we should have one in new york and one in la before the end of this year um hopefully one in austin as well and we just want to be able to, you know, somewhat fill those out and properly merchandise them. But what we really specialize in is that like last step in getting dressed, you know? So like, you know, now we're doing our hats, we're doing, you know, jewelry, of course, uh, sunglasses, those kinds of just like little additions. And now like EDC stuff, like I'm, I think that stuff's really fun, you know, like little pocket knives and dice and, you know, cool stuff like that. My friend Peter McKinnon got me really into that stuff. I wasn't really even familiar with that world before. And, like and now I get mean? it. Yeah, just, just all those like little things that you can collect, you know? I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I'm part of the EDC community. Like those people are very passionate. They know their shit. What does EDC so, stand for? Everyday carry. Everyday carry, okay. Yeah, so it's just, you know, they ha have all kinds of different things that live in that world. I think, you know, knives are probably the most common for that, but you know, people carry coins or dice or different things. It's um, like pirates, brother. Yeah, it's cool though, I love it. Like it, it's just, it's such a powerful community um, and I'm really attracted to those things. I mean, I, I've always loved those like small niche kind of subcultures. Like when I think about the music I've been into, it was always that, you know, it was always like you know, a little bit underground. Even when I was into like a, a, you know, four or five year phase where I was really into electronic music, but like I was always so against electronic music when I was younger, younger because in my mind I'm like, well, they don't use instruments, like this is ridiculous. But then I discovered the really like underground techno world. Um, you know, the stuff that's kind of sketchy and seedy and you know, it, it's, it's not in big clubs kind of thing. You know, yes, you have to yes, kind of go yes. to the like dodgy ones. And I loved that. And it was a similar community, you know, it's like this kind of like almost outcast community. Yes, kind of that's like that. all the hype that we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Like we just want to stay true to ourselves, to our art, to our craft, right? Exactly. That's yeah. amazing. So I would say that, would you say that um, it, it is? So Clocks and Colors, it's an extension of yourself. Big time, big time. Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know how it could be described as anything else because, you know, the products are literally just things I want. That's all it is, right? So, you know, it stays authentic that way and it stays an extension of me. And, you know, we've, we've had a lot of people come along and offer to buy it or try to buy it, et cetera. And, you know, obviously, like when you see those numbers come across your desk, it's like, shit like you know that could really change my life like that that's pretty crazy um but then you start thinking and you're like yeah but this is who i am and and now these really crazy opportunities are being presented because of it and i'm like these kinds of opportunities these kinds of doors that are opened they're worth so much more than money you know like i've never cared about being like rich or not saying that i could buy a yacht with anything that i've built or anything but you know like i've never thought oh i want yachts and blah blah, blah. um I, I wanted to be able to have cool conversations like this and hang out with cool people and, you know, um, hang out with the musicians that I've admired since I was a kid. And, you know, now I've done collaborations with so many artists that, you know, when I was a kid, I would have lost my mind to even build to like shake hands with, you know? Um, and one we can't really talk too much about that you know uh, that we should be inking the deal on any day now. I don't know when we'll be able to announce it, but this is the, this one is, by far the craziest it's absurd it's to me it's, it's, it's truly it's insane. insane like i i can't believe it's happening like i mean it, the contract's not signed so you know you never know but it looks really really good right now and, and i have a meeting with this person at the end of the month you know to go sit down and work with them for a whole day on, on designs and like it's ridiculous it's surreal and i can't put a dollar value on that you know like you could you could sell your company and have a bunch of money but what the hell good is it like it, now you're just some dude with money like this is infinitely cooler you know it's more fun for, for sure way more fun let's go on that side on, on the collaborative side because um you were in high school you loved badass music like very heavy metal and then again i don't know how many years went by and you're partnering partnering up with avenged sevenfold yeah how yeah, that was crazy how that happened that's insane uh it was a weird way that we got connected um we were chatting with these guys that were potentially going to invest in us uh, and they're saying, hey, you know, weirdly, like one of our investors is uh, is the singer from Avenged Sevenfold. Would you want to connect with them? And I was like, damn right. And they're like, cool, we'll just add him to the call right now. And I was chatting with them. And they just added him to the call. And I'm like, 
Oh what? man, <laughs> this is wild. Play it cool, play it cool. Yeah, I'm just like, uh, am I seriously just <laughs> chatting with him now? And he was just super chill. Now we just text, like we just, you know, have chats back and forth. He was telling me this hilarious story. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. Anyway, my favorite visual artist was doing their album artwork and an enormous, enormous celebrity, like is A-list as A-list gets, shows up at that guy's studio and he's like, I want that painting. And, and he's like, no, well, it's, it's for this band's artwork. And he's like, I'll pay anything. And he's like, well, no, it's for them. And he's like, okay, I'll pay 10 times what they were gonna pay. And so my, my buddy from Avenge shows up and he's just like, hey, you know, we're here for our artwork. And, and the artist is like, yeah, I sold sorry, it. I sold it. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, he made new artwork for them, obviously. But, <laughs> but it's cool to be able to have those kinds of conversations with True. somebody, you know? Like, I would have never imagined that. Um, so yeah, that, that was pretty wild. But they were fired up to do it. They, they were familiar with our brand already. And uh, you know, they, they do a lot of merch and, and you know, just thought it'd be a cool activation. And it was wicked. Was that the yeah. first uh, huge collaboration that you were like blown away by it? Honestly, one of the biggest collabs for me personally was not the biggest in terms of like reach or scale. And, and that's kind of how it's often gone. Like we've collaborated with some huge artists before, but like it's not really my world, so I don't get as fired up about it as other people on my team. Um, but one of the collabs that I went crazy for, actually two of them, because we were right around the same time, one was with, with Every Time I Die, who was just, they were a huge, huge, huge inspiration for yeah, me when yeah, I was a kid yeah. playing guitar and everything. Um, and it was just the craziest thing to be able to have conversations with Keith Buckley, the singer, like Andy Williams, like these are like people that like, they were gods to me, you know? And, and then they're just buddies and they're like, yo, come out to like our, our boat show in New York and stuff. And I'm like, what? Like, a, sadly I couldn't make that, but um, they've since broken up unfortunately. And that, that was, it was a pretty dramatic breakup too. So it's a pretty big bummer, but uh, you know, just being able to do that was incredible. And then we did a collaboration with Lamb of God who are like legends in the metal world, you know, like that's just absolutely wild. So yeah, I mean, in terms of biggest, not the biggest, but like those are some that like were really, really exciting for me. Um, we also did a really cool collaboration with Peter McKinnon, who you're probably familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, and he's since become a really good friend as well, which is super cool. You know, like it's, it's awesome to, to have these things start with art, you know, and like grow into something you know, more than that and something that's gonna like kind of last beyond the club. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, um, with music you have pretty, pretty clear, like it's music that you've, um, it's bands that you've been playing since you were in high school. But how did Peter McKinnon come into your radar or your thoughts or your mind to collaborate with? Yeah, that one, uh, I had several people come to me saying, hey, you should work with this guy. Like he, he's a big fan. So we started sending him product for a while. Um, and then we just reached out, kind of a, like a similar thing with chatting with you. Um, you know, he was just already wearing it. We knew he already liked it. Um, and I just reached out and we met and we just kind of hit it off. Like it, it was just immediately like we were buddies. It was funny, I, I did his podcast as well. And, uh, and people afterwards, like in the comments, there was probably a thousand comments being like, are you guys brothers? Like, what is this? You know, like we're, we just, just have a very a good similar energy. energy. Like we, you know, we, we talk very similar. We look kind of similar. Like it was just a strange, like, instant connection and uh yeah we've just been good buddies since yeah and after that um you still made a couple other collaborations so i'm wondering like I i've followed clocks and cutters for like five years i think or more probably more but um i remember seeing clocks and the great frog or any other huge big uh jewelry brands and i see them still doing the same things you know mm -hmm. so what do you think was a key factor to stand out and grow as much as Klux has grown? I don't know, like I, I, th I think those brands are still massive, you know, like we want to live in that world of the Great Frog and, you know, King Baby and uh, Chrome Hearts even. Uh, all those brands are significantly more expensive. So I think that certainly helps us. Um, and I just think we're a little bit, uh, for lack of a better way to explain it, I think we're maybe a little bit more youthful Uh, you know, like a lot of those brands are, are several decades old and I have so much respect for them, you know, to stuck around that all that time and just continued growing. Um, they've obviously been huge inspirations for us. Although transparently, like when we started, I didn't know any of those brands, you know, like a lot of people weirdly, actually our very first collection, we released this ring that was all inspired by medieval stuff. And one of the rings essentially had the Chrome Hearts logo all over it. It was that, like the nautical cross, or not the nautical cross, sorry, the uh, Celtic cross. Mm -hmm. 
only because we were trying to do medieval stuff. And at the time, I mean, this is like eight or nine years ago, there was no Instagram. Um, I wasn't shopping in stores that were selling Chrome hearts, that's for sure, you know? So I was not familiar at all. Um, and they sent us a cease and desist, and that's how oh, I learned shit. about them. I, I had no idea, and I was like, oh. What is that, like almost like a, like suing you? The, it's, it's like the first step. It's like, hey, either destroy this product or we're gonna sue you. Um, destroy? So yeah, so we had to just melt it down, which is the nice wow. thing about silver. And it was fine, and it, but it's funny because it was the most innocent thing. Like we literally had no idea. That's how we learned about them. But obviously, since I followed them and like being inspired by them, and you know they're an incredible company. Um, but yeah, that was just a weird kind of coincidence. So we're talking about the big stuff now, like like the successes. But like taking taking it back a little bit more to the beginning of Clocks and Colors, was it tough to like start? You already had like a this whole experience with Vitali, um, but did you like immediately like hit good, or did you get investors, or how how did did, did it? Yeah, launch? no, I mean we we were talking about this a little bit earlier today, but like I think we've been through hell and back like a hundred times. Um, you know, we've been in a pretty good place for a while now, but you know now we're dealing with our with a new set of battles. You know, whether it's like geopolitical stuff that's happening or whether it's with this kind of attack on uh, targeted media spends right now, you know, like all these updates to iOS and blah, blah, blah are making it really hard for smaller companies like us to market because we can't be as targeted anymore. Um, but it's nothing we're not used to at this point because we've been through so many challenges. But we started out with my $3,000 and then started going and then my business partner joined me. He put in his last $10,000. Uh, we started growing a little bit with that. And then we raised $58,000 from investors. And that's the last time we ever took money like for the business from investors. Um, and we just bootstrapped it. And how that. was that? Like asking someone for money, like that's at how the did time, you pitch? At yeah. the time it was really hard, you know, like people were like, like, what is this? Like, m like at the time it was more focused on men and they're like men's jewelry, like who, who's doing this? Like, you know, it, it was a really hard sales pitch, but fortunately uh, one of my buddy's dad Um, he, you know, had been extremely successful and he's like, look, you guys are passionate. You're super hard workers. He's like, whatever, you know, he was, he just kind of threw us 10 K he's like, look, I'll put in 10 K and he had a really, really impressive career. So I called all the other people that seemed sort of interested. And I was like, look, this guy just invested and every single one of them jumped on. Um, but it was funny because we raised $58,000. Like the amount of people I talk to now that start businesses and like, you know, before they've done anything, like millions. millions, you know? <laughs> and, and, and if I started a business now, like I wouldn't go out and bother raising money unless it's like one or two million, you know? But to us, 58,000 was like 58 million. Uh, you know, it was the craziest amount of money because my partner and I both came from, you know, pretty humble backgrounds and like we couldn't get money from our family or anything, like it just wasn't available. Um, so for us, that was all we had. But, but yeah, we bootstrapped with that. And because of that, you know, there were some pretty major challenges, but I think it made us really tough and resilient. Um, And also I see a lot of people get a lot of money when they start their business and they screw it up because they, they try to grow too fast, they spend it in dumb places, et cetera. We had no choice but to be really, really like strategic and really crafty, you know? Um, and I think that made us stronger in the end. But, but yeah, man, we've been through hell and back like a hundred times. I can think of probably like 10 different scenarios where I was convinced we were bankrupt. I was like, yeah, we're done. That's it, game over. Oh, um, you thought of it? Oh, many times, but really? we, we always made it through. like. There's so many scenarios, man, where that happened. Um, but every single time we got stronger after, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but it actually is true. So, you know, at this point now, we don't even really stress that much. We're like, okay, yeah, this is a tough moment. Let's figure out why and then let's yeah, just yeah. improve. So at these points when you almost felt you were on a bankrupt, how did you manage to pull yourself together? My partner and I have very different approaches. Um, he's just generally more calm and collected. He, he's a pretty stoic guy, very, very smart. Um, just kind of keeps his cool. Like if he's panicking, he does a really good job of keeping it in. <laughs> I'm, uh, not. I'm not that good at that. No, I like, I'm one of those people, I freak the hell out. Like I like lose it for 24 hours kind of thing, you know? Like I'm just a complete mess, total nutcase. And then I'm completely calm. You know, like that's just my system. Like it's really annoying for people around me, I'm sure of it but it's how, it's how I work. It's like I just blow all that energy out of my system and then I'm like, okay, time to focus. And then I like get right back into it. There's a um, quote that says explode and that's the only way to let the light come in. Huh, I Or love you, that. You must first I've never explode. heard that. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, that's my approach. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about one piece that um, I loved it, and I don't know why I haven't gotten it, but um, it's a very badass brand, right? Bikers and hardcore music, and but then again, you made this ring that says mom with the heart in the <laughs> middle. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know, man. I'm a mama's boy. It was funny because I was, I was actually getting that ring made for me. Like I wasn't actually planning to sell that one. And then I saw it. I'm like, this is so sick. Like, let's just put it online, see what happens. And it got such a crazy response, which I should have known. Yes. But I have it tattooed on my shoulder and it's like, it's the same it's tattoo. On, it's very similar. Like it's That's that insane. classic heart with mom. Right. Um, but my family's really, really small. Like it's, it's basically just my grandparents, my mom and my brother. Um, and so, you know, I'm really close with my mom and, uh, yeah, I just thought it was a cool idea. So would you say it's like a symbol, that ring? I think so. I mean, I think it captures a lot of things, like obviously my relationship with my mom, but also that heart with mom is such a classic tattoo. You know, like you look at like, what I like about it and what I've always liked about it is that you can look at the biggest, scariest biker dudes and half of them have that tattooed, you know? Um, it's, it's this relationship it's, with it's mom, this right? kind of Yeah, it's this kind of like, it's like this weird thing where it's like you're allowed to be soft when it comes to your mom, you know, which I like about it. You know, it's like it, you can be really hard and badass all you want, um, but, but no one's going to be, no one's giving you a hard time for being soft when it comes to your mom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you that for so long, brother. So we've, we've talked about Vitali, clocks and colors, and then Eta love. What does Eta mean? I thought Eta. it was Eta. Eta. Eta is hate spelt backwards. Ah. Yeah, so love I, hate. Yeah, exactly. So I had that idea just randomly a few years ago, right before starting the brand. Uh, really, first I had the idea for just hate spelled backwards, um, but I wanted to do a women's brand, and and I realized that it looked like a women's name, like Etta, and I was like, well, it we should complete so it much. so it sounds uh -huh. like a full name. And then I was like thinking about tattoo culture and like the love hate tattoos, and I was just like, ah, oh, this just makes so much sense. And I was shocked that it had never been used or taken. Like we were able to get all the handles and the URLs and stuff. So. That's kind of where that one started. So Etta Love was a really natural kind of build out. Like what it was initially supposed to be was f like a women's brand for all the women that were kind of following clocks and colors. Because we didn't want to add a women's line to clocks. Mm -hmm. uh, we just why thought not? it would be kind of confusing because mm -hmm. um, it had been a men's line for so long. Um, so we were like, why don't we just build a separate brand? And, and we felt like if we did it through clocks, it might be a little bit limited. Um, so we're like, okay, well, we'll build it as like a sister brand, you know, and, and that way it can kind of take on its own life, which I'm really glad in hindsight we did that because it really has, like it's, it's become very much its own thing. Um, and I have, you know, somebody on my team, her name's Jackie to thank for that because she, it was funny. I started the brand, you know, around an idea that I had for it. It was kind of like this, like, like I said, you know, extension of the clocks brand. Um, but Jackie has always been this very like authentic person in the world that I wanted Etta to speak to. And so I kept going to her. I was like, hey, you know, what do you think about these product ideas? What do you think about like this tone, this logo, this whatever? She was in Clucks and you were asking her. She was working that? for the company. Mm -hmm. um, at the time she was doing a lot of communication stuff, uh, you know, like working with influencers, that I've, kind of thing. I've shared so many emails with her. I exactly. love her so She's much. Amazing, right? She's amazing. She's an incredible person. Um, and also one of the, you know, you, you have like certain things when you build a business that you know, you'll never forget and that you're proud of. And, and like her story is one of my favorite ones. Um, you know, she started working in the warehouse um, and she worked her way all the way up. She's now the executive creative director for Etta Love, which is like the role I play for Clocks and Colors. Um, and she runs Etta Love, like that that brand is hers. Like it's her voice, it's, it's, it's entirely her, you know? And so- That's amazing. It's really, really cool to have seen her like grow that much. And, and she has so much ownership of it and so much passion around it. And she works so damn hard. Um, so really cool. Yeah. So three brands, any other side businesses? <laughs> well, we're, we're working on a fourth brand right now. So what? Yeah, so we'll have a fourth brand launching, I think in July, very different from anything we've done. Um, this any sneak peeks? Uh, I can probably show you something afterwards, but it's not gonna be like, to your taste, it's a very, it's a completely, completely different thing. Um, but it's, it is jewelry. It's more like kind of like fine jewelry stuff. Um, but targeting a completely different audience again, which is, you know, how we go. Like, you know, we, we love to build brands and I was thinking, you know, I think it's time that we try this community. Um, so yeah, it'll be pretty cool. And then I've personally become really obsessed with the health and wellness space. Um, you know, just because of certain health issues I've had on, on my end, I've, 
you know, really, really been obsessed with just researching and learning how to improve immune system or like nervous system stuff, et cetera. Um, and that has led me to working towards another business which should be launched uh, hopefully early next year. Um, but that'll be in like, kind of like the med tech space and it'll be you know, a pretty huge thing. I'll, That's I'll, insane. I'll make sure you get one when we have them, but uh, it's really cool. Yeah. Do you think um, you're looking a lot into the um, health space because you worked so much that you stop taking care of yourself maybe yeah. a lot of stress yeah. a lot of I I've, I've, I've reached like legitimate physical burnout multiple times that's why I'm supposed to be doing a sabbatical right now you know okay. to be totally honest like I've I've gone through really extreme periods of being a workaholic um, which is not something I advise like I think that there's a lot of people out there right now I won't name names that you know are quite famous for pushing what I call like work porn, you know, like they, work porn? yeah, it's I've like, never heard of that. I, I, it's just what I call it. It's like, you know, the, this idea that like work more, like you should be like, you know, you can never work hard enough. Like everyone should be trying to be like a multi, 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 multi millionaire. And, you know, I think it gets in people's heads and, and they feel guilty if they're not just 24 seven trying to work and improve and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I've gone through that many, many times and I've, it's resulted in literal burnout, you know, not just emotionally, but like full physical burnout. Um, and it's like impacted my nervous system, all kinds of things. So, uh, you know, I, it definitely is what led me to it, but I'm actually really grateful because I see myself getting more and more into that through the, like into my kind of later years in life. Like I, I've just find it really fascinating. I love learning about it. Um, and there's just so much incredible stuff happening in that world right now. Like the, the advances that are taking place, I'm fully and 100% convinced that within a decade, they're going to be able to reverse aging. What? Like full blown reverse it. Yeah. And this is not like some, you know, quack conspiracy thing. This is like the best scientists in the world are convinced. And, and many of them think it'll be far sooner than that. Even it's some really, really crazy stuff. Like there's this doctor I follow. His name is David Sinclair. Fascinating guy. Like he's the, I think he's the head of the Harvard biology and aging department, something like that. Um, but this guy's just doing incredible work. He's got me like getting hooked up to IVs to do like NAD and stuff. Oh, like, that's the thing that you sent me. Yeah. I was like, what is this? I, I yeah, have no idea. I'm like hooked on it now. Um, yeah, really, really fascinating stuff though. But like his, his, uh, lab has been able to do some of the craziest stuff. Like they've been able to reverse, literally reverse the age of mice. Uh, well specifically their eyes, but that's pretty wild. W you would know? you get into that? Oh man, big time. Really? I, like big time. That's why I'm so fascinated by this stuff. I want to be like, I'm going to be lined up, you know, like Benjamin Button me. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> like if I can go back to 25 year old body, hell yeah. Why not? You know, imagine having your body that you had at 25, but having the brain of a 40 year old, you know, like the intelligence that you've acquired, your wisdom, all that kind of stuff. That's sick. It is. <laughs> but what do you think about going against nature itself? we're always going against nature. I've always found that a really funny thing. It's like everything humans do goes against nature. Like if you take any kind of medication, you're going against nature. What, what are antibiotics? Antibiotics are science that make you live longer, right? Like the, the average person lives more than twice as long as they would have lived 200 years ago. Why? Because of all the things we do to go against nature. True. Right. We only got one shot. Might as well make that, the best of that's it. That's right? how I see it. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I can extend my life and see more and more, like I'm fascinated by all the things that, you know, we see in this world. And I find like the whole narrative that like the world is going to shit gets really old. Like it, it's not, it's not, there's definitely bad things happening. There's always going to be bad things happening, but objectively the world is the best it's ever been, you know, other than maybe like pollution, pollution need, we need to get a handle on that for sure. Like the environment definitely needs to be taken seriously, but like, you know, look, I'm, I'm no expert, but if you look at the data on most things, the world is improving. Like, you know, everything from quality of life to, yeah, it's not perfect. We have a long way to go, but things like racism, et cetera, it's all improving. It needs to go a lot further, but you know, definitely, um, definitely. And I want to see where it goes. And it's, um, it, it's been ramping up in such a short time, right? Like if you go back to like my grandma, like if like talking to her, like, yeah, I went to Japan and I stayed in this place. She's like, how the heck, you know, if you go back even further, like it's been like 150 years since traveling was only imaginary almost. Yeah. Yeah, or exactly. Such an adventure, you know, like you had, you'd have to go through, I don't know, ships and months and 
everything is so beautiful now. Like, I love that question whenever someone asks me, like, where would you live? Like, what time of life would you live? Like, everyone's all like the 70s or 50s. And yeah. I'm like, this is the best time in life. I think this is one of the best for sure. There is one thing I will say, though. I do feel the phone, like just having a phone all the time is ruining us. That's the one complaint I have. Like other than, you know, let's not get into like the bigger like geopolitical things and that kind of stuff. But like in general, like in terms of quality of life, I actually think our phones in so many ways are making it far worse. Like I think it's impacting our ability to focus. I think it's impacting our ability to have like real conversations with people. Um, and I think it's just making it so yeah, we're, we're just, we're all becoming like really very ADHD, you know? True. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with just always being connected to that device. Definitely. But I think a lot of us are waking up to that and, and you know, it's going to take some time. Like I'm still trying to figure out the best way to approach it. I actually just ordered another phone so I can have a second phone line and basically nothing on that phone so that I can just carry that around and not really be distracted. Um, you know, so people are looking for the solutions, but you know, we're the first generation or a couple generations to have that true so you, you and know, we don't know time. like how it, it will impact us exactly like how um i don't know the smoking industry started exactly. my parents told me like back then like even like doctors would say it was a good thing to do it you know yeah like we don't know how bad that's that's gonna work in our minds on our behavior i think we've got a pretty good idea now we, and we I, don't, do. I don't think it's good <laughs> I, I don't th i think um it doesn't reflect a lot on the way we're approaching it maybe you and me and people who surround us but like Brother TikTok or those growing monsters yeah. that you own, that you get to see it on the streets on on the lines of these um, coffee shops that um everyone's yeah. there to like take the photograph, like it doesn't seem like it's going backwards. I think it's going to change though. I, I'm I'm optimistic, and, and you know maybe this is just my nature. Like, and I can seem negative because I you know I can definitely focus in on things that that are not good. But then that's kind of how that's my system. You know, I focus in on it and then I start thinking about, okay, but here's the solves and here's what's being worked on and then I, I can deal with it, right? Um, but when it comes to this stuff, I think a lot of people are trying to solve these problems and I think we're going to have solutions. Um, you know, and I think some of that is just our own will, like, you know, to improve. Um, and I think some of it will be technology solves, sure. et cetera. But, you know, it might even be new communities. I wouldn't even be surprised if you start seeing communities pop up where they're like, yeah, this is like a no phone community or something. Wow. You know, that'd be really cool. That'd be really cool. Um, For sure. Do you imagine how much more present those people would be? I could see that happening in like Sedona, Arizona or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm up for that. Like, I think but then again, right. the metaverse is growing and people are buying their land on this <sighs> new other world. Like, man, I there's no middle point on that, you know? Like you're no. either in it very much or you're trying to escape away from it. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation that, that terrifies me. I get why it's becoming a thing. And, and like, you know, I understand escapism and like, you, you got to think about like how a lot of people live in the world and where they live, et cetera. Like I understand, like, you know, I, we're very, very fortunate to have the opportunities we have to be able to travel and see things in real life and, you know, be able to afford to eat good food and, and blah, blah, blah. So I do understand why that's becoming a thing. Uh, I wish it wasn't because it freaks me the hell out, to be totally honest. Like, um, I wrote an essay uh, when I was in university, like first year university, uh, and I proposed this idea called a self-induced technologic autism. And the idea was that people would essentially live through their devices uh, and in virtual worlds more than they would live in real life. And, and that sounds so obvious now, but I wrote that like, I don't know, when was that? Like 18 years ago or something. Wow. Right? Missionary, um, <laughs> but you know, I had the idea. I don't know if you can say this, but I had the idea of mushrooms. I'm a huge psilocybin fan, and I was like deep on on mushrooms. Uh, and I just randomly wrote the essay. I woke up thinking that it was gonna be some gibberish. Like I thought it was gonna be hilarious, and, and I woke up and I was like, it "Man, ma it makes sense." Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, but you know, it's happening now. Like that's exactly what's Definitely. happening. Um, I get it. Tell me about mushrooms. How's your experience with that? Because um, I've always been against drugs because of some experiences I've had in, in, that I've seen, that I've lived in when I lived in Los Angeles when I was a little kid. Right. I was like 17, 18, seeing right. horrible things, you know? I think it's really important to understand that the title drugs is kind of unfair. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say that everybody should start doing all the different drugs, etc. But like, there are enormous differences. And they're also largely misunderstood. Like, so many of the drugs, even the ones that you know, are, are notoriously considered like really horrible and really scary. If they were 
properly understood, you know, they're really not that bad for the majority of people, you know, like the majority of the people that get really hooked on them and, and, you know, you see really awful things happen with those people. I don't think it's necessarily the drug's fault, you know, like for sure anybody can get hooked on some of them. There's no question. That's why there's a huge opioid epidemic in the States, et cetera. Um, but like at the end of the day, I think that most of the time there's a bigger issue at hand when somebody has issues with drugs, but kind of getting back to mushrooms, I'm a huge fan. I, I actually think that virtually everyone should try them unless like maybe there's like a predisposition to things like schizophrenia or something in your family. It can trigger that. So maybe that's not the right person to try it, but, um, it really opens your mind and they're not addictive. People don't die from them. Um, I've never really seen a, a bad outcome from them, you know, and, and I've probably not including like microdosing, which I've done like a million times, but I've probably done like heavy doses of mushrooms. I don't know, 50 to a hundred times in my life. Um, and the heroic, how they call it. Heroic yeah. Not dose. always heroic between like one and four grams. Yeah. Heroic would be more which like is less the four than, grams than, than a little bit less than heroic. Heroic's like four to five usually is what they say. Um, and I've done that, yeah, at least, you know, 20 or 30 times, but, um, you know, kind of like mixing it up and it's so dependent too on the mushroom. Like some mushrooms are really, really potent and some aren't. Um, but I think they're beautiful. I think they're like an amazing way to experience the world. They, they give you access to a different part of your brain. And there's so much research coming out that shows that like they have really, really powerful medicinal purposes and, and abilities. And I'm really excited for that. And, and there's a lot of other hallucinogenics or, or, um, what's the better word for it? Hallucinogenics is not a good word mm -hmm. for those kinds of drugs. Uh, psychedelics is probably a better word. Um, but yeah, I've, I'm, I'm really, really into this kind what of stuff. What would you say is that, um, what's the most important thing that has shaped up in your perspective, like either creative or personal? Um, this is going to sound like just kind of cliche and really obvious, but it, it's really just that our perspective is very, very narrow, you know, and that sounds, deadly obvious, but like when you take something like mushrooms, you really quickly realize how differently you could just be viewing the world, like, or you could view the world, sorry, like it can just, whether it's just literal, like just how you're actually looking at things, like things start to morph and change and you realize like, oh man, like the way I see things really is just like this perception, this like one filter that my eyes are placing on things or to how you think about things, like all of a sudden you start questioning things and thinking about them in a totally different way. And you're like, I didn't even know that my brain was capable of thinking of these things this way. Right. Um, and I think that that's why I like the idea of everybody trying mushrooms. I think so many people are so set in their ways and they think like everything is black and white and the world is one way. And I think that they do a really good job of, of helping you realize that there are different ways to see things. The same reason that people should travel if they can. Again, I understand that not everybody has the ability or, you know, um, you know, the money, et cetera, necessary to do that. But if you can travel, you should, because, you know, you meet people who have never traveled and it's so hard for them to put themselves in other people's shoes or to look at the world differently. And I think that a lot of psychedelics are very, very good at helping people quickly see those different perspectives. Mm. That's why so many artists love them, right? Like it just mm -hmm. opens your brain to totally different ways of looking at things. And whenever you experiment with this, with, with mushrooms, do you do it as an A-B testing? Or do you write something down? Do you have like a sort of... I don't really have any system. I mean, honestly, a lot of the times that we do them, it's just for fun. You know, like most common way I'll do it is with like, you know, four or five buddies. You don't want to be in a huge group and we'll take them and then we'll just go for a big walk in the woods. The best thing is being in nature on on a lot of psychedelics in fact um and with a good group of friends people you really trust uh and that's amazing and that's usually just us laughing a ton and like just having a good time but i've certainly done them in other kind of contexts where you know it's a lot more about like going in with you know kind of a a, a mission or, or something that you really like want a purpose to, yeah a purpose exactly um and that's been really great too you know just they help you really get there and get there fast that's and sometimes crazy. super aggressively mm -hmm. um There's also something really amazing too that can happen if you take a, a huge dose. Um, I've only had it happen once. I've had friends where it happens a lot, um, but you get this thing called ego death and it's the most bizarre experience. It's like you as the individual just disappear. Like you, it's like you no longer know who you are or anything. Um, and it, it, it's, so 
for example, mushrooms are starting to be used for a lot of people uh, towards end of life. Like, let's say that, you know, mm -hmm. they have a terminal cancer or something. They're being used to allow people to experience things like that and realize that, like, it's okay. You know, like, once once you're gone, it's okay. Like, you know, and and when you do these huge doses and you have that ego death, you know, you, like, you kind of realize that we are all just energy and we are kind of just nothing. And again, you know, I don't like chatting too much about this because it sounds cheesy and everybody has their different perspectives on it. But that's been my experience. You know, it's, it's kind of like calmed me down and made me realize like everything's perception and and it's OK that, you know, we might be gone one day kind of thing. So well, why would you say you want to um, you would be lined up to to um, do this uh, procedure where you can be healthier again? like? like you said, like being 25 with the mentality of the age you, you have. Like if you, for one side, you accept that, okay, we're gonna be gone and that's cool. Why would you wanna? Just because I accept it, it doesn't mean I want it, right? Um, like I'm in no <laughs> rush to die. I like my life and I think it's just getting cooler. Um, you know, I, I'm investing a lot of time, energy and money into my health because I've had my issues here and there. Um, and. I want to live longer and I want to live a healthy life while I live longer, you know, like I want to feel strong and capable of doing all the things I want to do, whether it's like crazy hikes or, you know, I like being physically active all the time. So, I mean, if I can live to be two or 300 years old or longer, I'm going to do it, you know? And, and for a lot of people that sounds silly. It's like, of course you can't do that. It's like, well, you probably can. Like we're probably one of the first generations where wow. that might actually be possible. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> No, for real. I know it sounds crazy, but basically they've been able to, like they can already show, essentially they can show proof that this is doable. They, like our bodies are consistently replacing their cells, right? Um, but because of the way that the cells are wired or, or programmed or whatever you want to call it, um, they are essentially programmed to eventually start to break down and, and they start to, like the mitochondria wall starts to break down. I'm not a scientist, I'm terrible at explaining this, but essentially, you know, those things start to weaken, but there's already animals, for example, that can regrow limbs, etc., and they're already doing things to, to animals and even to people where they're showing that they can increase the length of life or, or even almost reverse it, etc. So it's, it's not unreasonable. And what you have to think about, right, is like, let's say that they haven't figured out how to reverse age in 10 years. They've certainly figured out how to massively extend it. Um, so you know, let's say that you can live an extra 30 or 40 years. Within that 30 or 40 years, there's an extremely high probability that they figured out how to reverse it, right? So, I don't know. I think, That's I think we're gonna brother. see it. You know, I think we're gonna see people who could live forever or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. so much, man. Yeah, it's wild. Okay, before we leave this um, mystical part of the podcast, I wanna ask you something. Have you ever heard about um, people consuming either silver and gold, like synthesizing it into the body? No. Why? Okay. Ho holy crap, there's this huge thing. I have a really good friend who actually consumes gold. I can't see the yeah. benefit of that. I can only see negatives. Like heavy metal poisoning is a real issue. No, like this is not a thing you want. They have to like synthesize it in a very weird way. Okay. It's not just like that, you know? Um, and it's very interesting that you work a lot with these silvers, but I have a good friend. I right. don't know very well. I'm not a scientist as well. Yeah. But he's consuming gold to um, connect, have more connections in his body. Like, and it makes sense. Like the way he was saying it. Um, he didn't want to go deep into it, but um, gold. It's it, it's it's been so sacred by so many cultures back in thousands of years. So they say it's got a secret to connect. Like even the way it's uh, made, it comes out from the nucleus of the world, from the center. It comes out as blood of the world. But then again, it's, 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 it's quite crazy beautiful. Talk. Like yeah. the, the part of me that like science is terrified for this person, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, may, maybe it's a really cool thing. I, I honestly, there's, you know, I know nothing. Like, what do I really know? So, you know, that sounds pretty cool. What you said sounds pretty cool too, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want I want you to try uh, mezcal. Done. It's arroqueño. Should, should we? Jalapeno? Yeah, we should. Arroqueño. Oh, okay. Jalapeno. <laughs> Jalapeno. I was like, all right. Well, like spicy that. mezcal. Yeah. This, this was made by Semey Garcia in Miahuatlán, Oaxaca. It comes out from the... What was that? Oh, like something on your roof. Like a boat. So, um, 
what would you say it's a secret between being very successful in your brand, in your work, and in, in everything that you do, and also having a very healthy life? Where is the secret secret hidden between... Oh, I don't know yet. Someone's got to teach me that. <laughs> <laughs> you're finding it right now. I'm trying to figure out balance. Um, and I think I'm okay at it, but I've got a lot of work to do, for sure. <laughs> burned? That's got a little burn. It's, ni it's nice, though. <laughs> I, heard um, it. I heard it. Yeah, no, I, I have... Uh, I have work to do, but I, I think, you know, the first thing obviously is just becoming aware of it. Like I know so many people that are workaholics and I think especially because of all the, like, like I said, like work porn kind of stuff that's out there. I think they're like really proud of that. Um, and I've been there for sure too, but I don't think that's a good thing. So I think like at least even becoming aware that you work too much is a pretty good first step. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's all about finding that balance, right? And like, I think it was probably something that people are in constant pursuit of. I for sure am. Um, hopefully I get a lot better at it than I am right now. <laughs> Would you say, um, okay, you obviously took this sabbatical to find that balance, right? I did, but I'm, it's I'm not, not working. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's going to work out. Like I've, I've kind of come up with a new strategy for how I'm going to approach it. I think that'll be a little bit more realistic. Um, But yeah, I mean, even even the fact that I tried to do this, it allowed me to take a little bit of a step back. You know, I put things in place where it was like, you know, it removed me from certain things, which gave me a little bit of distance from, you know, from the day to day. Um, but yeah, it's tough. So if you're doing this research on how to find balance and peace between work, working not so much and, and living and being healthy and all that, do you keep track of all of these? Like, do you have a journal, a diary for, so to say? I need to journal. That's... Um, we have this executive coach we just started working with. He's really, really thoughtful. And he's like, you need to journal. And I have in the past, it's going to sound so silly, but my writing is really bad for one thing, like hieroglyphic, like I can barely read my own writing. Oh, like, uh, yeah. Okay. My handwriting. And, uh, it's really slow. Like it bogs me. Like I, I think so much faster than I write. I type a lot faster than I write, but when it comes to journaling, like I've done a lot of journaling through typing and it just, It, journaling feels like it should be done by hand. It should be slowed down, but because of that, I don't do it. So I, right now I just have no journaling practice. The odd time when I do do it though, I'm like, why don't I do this more? And it, it really like starts to kind of set me straight. Mm -hmm. um, so when I do start my next round of my sabbatical, when I like hit reset, I will absolutely be journaling. That's going to be like a, a requirement, like every morning, like meditate and then journal. Um, but you know, I'm not that person who's going to sit here and be like, I have all the best habits in the world. I have quite a few pretty decent habits. You know, I'm very consistent with exercise. I'm very consistent with like intermittent fasting and I meditate a decent amount, th those kinds of things. But like, you know, you have a lot of these like We're really successful entrepreneurs yeah, yeah, yeah. that like have this, like, here's my day. And it's like, that's never going to be my day, man. Like, I, I don't even want my day to be like that scheduled mm -hmm. out, you know, but I do got to get journaling in there. It's, it's fun because, um, it, it, I mean, it, it's. Like, journaling maybe has to be slow, you know? Because we're always living in this fast pace, right? Maybe that's the whole secret yeah. behind it, to be I, calm. I think it is. I think you're right, and, and I think I'm coming to terms with that. It just annoys me because I'm thinking through something. I, I think I always have this feeling that by the time I finish writing that one thought, my thoughts have already gone three thoughts past it, and then I'm going to forget. And then, like... I've failed at journaling. You know, it's like always this feeling like I'm not going to succeed at doing mm -hmm. it, but it's like, the hell are you trying to succeed at? It's your true. journal. No one's ever going to see true. it. You're probably never even going to read it again. Like, so maybe just the very act of it making you slow down yeah, is, yeah. is the goal. And right? slow down and especially be away a little bit from screens. You know, I think that that's too. a big one for me. That's why I don't want like to type. Pen that's why I don't want to type because yeah, I don't yeah. want to be at a computer. Uh -huh. What I did do, I bought this really shitty little laptop, like for like a hundred bucks that has nothing on it except like a word file. And I used that for a little bit for journaling, but it was the same thing. Like it felt just another screen, yes. you know, even though it's a different screen and even though I wasn't distracted by anything else and that did work it's in that screen, context, uh -huh. it's another screen. And I'm like, I don't want more screens. I want less. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest goal with my sabbatical. I was like, I just don't want to write emails. I'm so tired of emails. You know, it's like emails and Slack messages, like hundreds every day for the last, you know, over a decade. I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, no more emails. Yeah. Like I can't, I just want to make cool shit. 
do I always have to do emails to do it? You know, True. there's got to be a solution for that. True. I don't know. It's probably True. like a really good assistant or something. Do I don't you know. trust on letting go on trusting? Well, of course you do. You've built a very strong uh, team, but do you think that's another key factor? Like maybe you want everything to turn out so very well. For sure. That you want to be there in, in all emails. Going back to psychedelics, that's a big part of the, re I, I know a lot of very, very successful, very smart people. And I think they all have that in common. Like the mo majority of them, they're all kind of A-type people and they all really care about what they're doing. So it's very hard for them to step back and to like, you know, release some of that control. And yeah, I have a really good team and I try really hard not to micromanage, but it's still very hard for me to just like, you know, fully, fully step back. Um, and the cool thing about psychedelics is you have to give in to them. Like when you, when you take a heavy dose of mushrooms, you can't fight it. If you fight it, you'll have a bad time. That's when you have a bad time, you know? Uh, and I think that that's why so many kind of A-types and, and entrepreneurs, et cetera, are very attracted to them because it's, Letting go. It forces them to let go. You know, you have to. It's like good luck not letting wow. go, right? So it's crazy I, that you're so familiar with letting go, but then again, there's so many other things that you're still working on letting go. It's gonna always be a battle. It's gonna mm -hmm. be a constant True. battle. You know, like the the wolf in me is the A type, right? Like it's always gonna be hunting. Exactly. That balance, right? And and like I've gotta yeah, I've gotta balance it out. Like there's gotta be rest and there's gotta be reflection and uh yeah. I, that's what I, I loved that ring. Like when we did that piece, I was, I was really fired up on it because I've always liked the idea of being in the yang. We have we actually have a yin yang piece coming out soon, but like, yeah, I think everything is about balance, you know? Mm -hmm. um, literally everything, you know, even when you're talking science and the body, right? Like every little thing matters, like where your home, hormone levels are, uh, where your vitamin levels are, et cetera. Everything needs balance. And if it's not balanced, everything can start falling apart. So talking about balance, how's your relationship with social media? I think I have a really, that, that's one I think I've done well with. I think I have a really healthy relationship with it. Like you've probably seen, like I post. Barely. Yeah. Rarely. Every two months, mm -hmm. you know, maybe every three months. Um, I usually don't even have any social media on my phone. So the vast majority of the time, uh, there's nothing on it. I don't have a TikTok. I don't have a Snapchat. I don't really use Twitter. Um, like who uses Facebook anymore. Um, so like I have Instagram, I use it from time to time, especially like just for checking work related things. Um, but I have a notification that pops up if I've used it more than 15 minutes, which is very rare. 15 um, minutes a day? Yeah. What? And I feel guilty if I've used it more than 15 minutes. That's only on Instagram or, or our social media platforms? It, it's for Instagram, but I don't have any other ones on my 15 phone. 15 minutes. But I still use my phone way too much, but it's like, texting for example right like like i look you know you look at the history right how much time you spend and between like whatsapp and imessage sometimes i'm at like two hours in a day i'm like what what was i doing two hours like, that's a lot of time can you imagine yourself like two hours staring down at a screen it's a lot of time yeah but check your phone next time like no no, no, no. Do you ever look at that it's wild you know I, i do that every week you know like the average person spends like five or six hours looking at their phone which is just mind-blowing like Mind blowing. Do you know that the average user spends like, I think it's something like, look, don't quote me on this. It might've changed or whatever, but I swear the last time I saw the stat was an hour and 41 minutes on TikTok a day, every day. What is that doing to your brain? You know, <laughs> like, holy, that's some craziness. So yeah, I think my relationship is really healthy with it. Uh, with my phone, far less. That's why I just, like I said, I just got a new phone. I pick it up when I get back to Canada. Um, I'm going to give the phone number for it to like my mom, my business partner, like, you know, basically no one. Um, and it's basically just going to be Spotify maps, um, you know, and a, spe a specific email account for it that I can send like travel stuff to or whatever. And that's it. Like, so that what I carry around is just completely disconnected from the world, essentially. That's crazy, brother. And whenever you go on Instagram, what is it that you consume? What is it that you see? Is it an inspiration? Do you have, do you see any other designers or? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think my Instagram is pretty balanced. Um, you know, it's a lot of, yeah, like different fashion things, more like lifestyle stuff that I like, uh, motorcycle stuff, tattoo stuff, music stuff. Um, you know, it's just kind of all in, in that world. But, you know, I, I really don't do a lot of scrolling either. Like if I'm on there, it's like either responding to people in my messages or, Um, like checking our accounts, like the, the brand accounts. 
Um, but yeah, I just don't use it a ton. It's crazy because um, all social media platforms are pretty much always trying to, trying to convince us that we have to be there. We have to be creating content for them. Mm -hmm. And in a way you are, because I'm, I'm pretty sure um, all of your brands have a big space on, on social media. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny that way, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I drew, like I built that, right? Like our, our Instagram accounts were significant pretty early on. Um, and that's because I realized the power of it and I realized different strategies early days that we could use to, to really ramp those things up. And now obviously it's super important to our brands and you know, combined we're probably a couple million followers or something. Um, but it's, it's just not something that matters for me personally. You know, I know how important it is to the brands and we put a lot of time and energy. And so I understand social media really well because of those things. But as an individual, I don't get a lot of value out of it. Like <laughs> I, I've just watched my following shrink for several years, you know, um, and I could probably put some effort in to grow it again. But then I ask myself, like, why, what benefit is sure. there? You know, it's not going to do anything for me, you know? And, and I, I think I'll, I've had this conversation with a lot of people and I find it fascinating. Like you, you talk to somebody and they're like, well, I'm trying to get more likes and trying to get more followers. And this is like a normal conversation, right? Like it's not necessarily like somebody who is a career influencer or anything like that. It's just like, somebody who just feels that that's what they're supposed to do. And I, I remember asking people many, many times, like, why, why do you need to do that? And they're like, well, cause, well, cause why not? And it's like, but why? Like, what are you trying to accomplish with that? And they have no idea there's no, there's no answer. There's no reason. There's no justification. True. And that's what I realized for myself too. I was like, you know, if I post on social media, like 99% of people, when they post on social media, if I post a photo of myself, it's going to be infinitely better, which I don't even like getting photos of myself taken. So yeah, I've seen that, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like I like generally just kind of hide from the camera. Um, and if I post anything that's of like interest to me, it does really poorly anyway. And I realized I'm like, I like, why am I doing this? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. And I don't want to just post a bunch of photos of myself. It feels really vain and it doesn't actually benefit me in any real way. Um, so that's why I just don't really use it anymore. <laughs> Love it. But what would you say it's the secret behind that? Um, knowing that it's good for business whenever you have something to be shared out to the world, but then again, not in the personal side, right? Because yeah, it, it's, it's just understanding the why you're doing it, right? Like, like, cause I like, look, like I see so many people build these amazing, amazing careers uh, using social media, right? Including myself. I've just done it through my brands instead of do doing it through a personal brand, right? So like, I understand the value and, and we're certainly going to continue doing it with our brands. Um, but for me as an individual, there's no valuable why, right? Like I'm not getting any material gain out of it. Nothing that, yeah, sometimes things come along. Like, you know, I get like a little deal for doing a promotion or something, but like it doesn't justify the amount of energy and time I would have to put into it. So I, I just feel like not enough people ask why they do 99% of the things they do. Right, like uh, that's one of my favorite words. I was actually gonna get it tattooed right here. I'll probably still will. Just the word why. Um, it's such a simple three letter word, but like it should be applied to everything and nobody applies it to anything. I love it, I love it, I love it. I do, um, I've been journaling for so many years and every morning um, I start with a purpose. Like what is my purpose for this day? Love but that. I love why, like why am I doing this? So it's a side part of that, but um, on this same side, um, oh, I totally forgot what I, what I was gonna say. So how I do does that it, all day? <laughs> <laughs> so many thoughts in my mind, but yeah. um, you you started out with the the dream of making Lego, yeah. then you loved music, you wanted to um, design crazy. Uh, how how'd you call it? That quote when you wrote it when you were a little kid. I just wanted to design. Create anything and sell it to people. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like I just love the idea of creating products. And then I love how it all turned out. Like pretty much everything that you've done throughout your life. It's been a huge puzzle that it, all the pieces fall completely together. So what does the future look like for you and for your brands? Um, I mean, for clocks and colors, we're going to keep doing what I've been doing, which is just continuing to, you know, to grow the product assortment based on stuff that I think is cool and stuff I want. Like, I just have so much fun with it. Um, but in terms of my career, I think, you know, I'm going to keep growing those brands. 
Um, but I definitely see myself pushing a lot more into the health and wellness space because it's something that really matters to me. I want to do more things that I, I hate saying a lot of this stuff because it sounds cheesy, but I want to do more things that like actually are literally helping people. I feel really good about what we've done with my company because I think we've created a lot of really great jobs and, and opportunities for people. Um, and I'm really proud of that. Like I think that people live a lot better lives that work for us. Um, but I want to go a little bit further. Like I like the idea of helping people with their health or their mental health and things like that. Um, and this next business that I'm going to be launching really does that. But I think that that's a big part of my future is, uh, yeah, getting really into that space. I love how, um, all of your jobs, businesses, projects are always an extension of yourself. I don't know how people do it otherwise, you know, like I just don't get it. Like it, I, it boggles my mind when people do things that they're not into. I'm like, how do you spend That's crazy. your yes. whole day or, or like, I don't know. It just boggles me. I, and crap. I say this to people all the time. This is like, and most people will never listen to it, but I'm like, pursue what you're passionate about. It's that simple. And, and people go, oh yeah, but you know, that industry is like really competitive or it's really difficult to get into that world. I don't know anybody that has failed that pursued what they're really passionate about. And I mean, truly pursued it, not like sat around talking about that they want to do it and that, you know, this is what they want to do. And then at the end of the day, like, it's like, okay, how much time did you spend on that today? And then none, right. They just spend time talking about that. They're going to do it. But I mean, anybody who really pursued something, all of them have succeeded no matter what the industry, True. like I have so many friends who are massive DJs. Like what are the odds of that? Right. Every single one of them that was like, I'm doing it no matter what, like, some of my friends took like nine or 10 years before they made like, you know, more than like the bare minimum to survive and then just blew the hell up. Just like um, clocks and colors and everything that you've been making, right? Yeah, we, we were grinding, man, like for so many years. And it's funny because there was a big chunk of time where the brands were a decent size. So people thought like, oh, I must have money. And I was still broke as hell, like broke, broke, you know, like counting my pennies to like buy groceries kind of thing. And, you know, people didn't know that or see that, but it was still easy for me to get out of bed because I liked what I was doing and I knew that there was light at the end of the tunnel. And I feel like anybody who pursues something that they're really passionate about, that's, that ends up being the case, you know? Um, but it just boggles my mind how many people bail from what they like doing because they're like, oh, you know, what are the odds and blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, but you know what? Also, like, um, it's a complicated time in life. Again, going back to the phones and scrolling down, like, you've, you've had the fights, you've, you've won the battles, you, you love what you do, But then I can imagine like younger version of yourself, right? In college or high school, instead of like being into the music that you were into, just seeing someone else's life, seeing someone else succeed. Like that's very complicated thoughts that get into your head. Yeah, I mean, there's two ways of looking at that though, right? Like when I was a kid, I had no inspiration, you know? Like other than like maybe like later on, like after university, there was Dragon's Den or Shark Tank. I don't know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with these shows, but they're like these entrepreneurial shows. But now there's so much for kids to catch on to. And, and early on, like I have kids reaching out to me now that are like 16 talking about how they're going to start businesses. When I was 16, I was like, I'm going to do a rodeo nine snowboarding. Like that's all I was thinking about. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> have a clue what, like what I was going to do for a business, you know? So there's that too. Like they have a, a huge advantage in terms of, you know, having, you know, Because, you know, not a lot of kids or not a lot of kids, but there's a lot of people who maybe don't have a family that would, you know, inspire them to go into entrepreneurship or, or whatever it might be. And so they never had any kind of inspiration at any point in their life. But now there's a lot of access to that. But you're right. I mean, if they're focusing on all the vanity stuff, then that can be a problem. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, look, at they've already got a jet, blah, blah, blah. True. What are the odds of that? It's like, well, do you yeah, even want that? Is that what you need? And, and it's a very hard um, way to, of seeing it because that's the new nature for them, you know? Yeah. And like, it, it's complicated because everything that you've been making, it's stuff that you love doing. The music, the, the style, the black and white, because you're, you're colorblind. It, it's all an extension of yourself. But then again, you lived your life. You played your music. You, you just lived it. Now, a lot of lives are being very influent, influ um, inf influenced? influenced by what you see. Yeah. So then again, it, it's complicated, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, that's why I try to be as, as honest and, and transparent about my scenarios. You know, like I want people to understand that, like for the first six or seven years, it was like hell, you know, like I talk to people who think like within a year or two, they're going to be rolling in dough and that happens, you know, like there's for sure those success stories and, and, you know, people see that and they latch onto that, but that's not realistic. Like if you really want it, 
be ready for like battle, you know, and it's going to be a long one. True. Um, but I would so much rather battle for myself than like work in some job I hate forever without mm-hmm. trying, you know? Um, you know, it, it's like that cliche quote, right? It's like better to have loved and lost than to have never loved. It's the same thing with pursuing your passions or Definitely. you know what you're into. And I just genuinely believe you're going to be, you're, you're infinitely more likely to be successful at something you're good at and that you care about, you know, cause you're going to want to keep True. getting better at it. Right. Um, like Snoop Dogg was asked, how did he uh, manage to stay relevant for so many decades? And he said, I just stay true to myself. Yeah. That's the easiest thing you can he, do. He's such a good inspiration. I love that guy. Like he's a fascinating character and like, yeah, it's exactly it. He's been relevant forever. He's admired by everybody. Why? I think he's the most authentic person you can think of in pop culture. You know, he doesn't do anything for anyone but himself. And I like, I admire that so much. Sick. Yeah. Brother, um, this is a, a weird question. I don't know if you've thought about it, but I would love to seal this um, as a time capsule. Like, who do, would you dream on collaborating with in the future? Like, like just, just go balls out with your dreams. Like, or what would you love to like create with someone else? My number one goal has been for the last like eight years to collaborate with Travis Barker. Travis Barker to me is like the epitome of what I want clocks and colors to be. I think he's just, he's just so authentic. He does exactly what we've been talking about this whole time. He just pursues all the things he's interested in. And like, that's such a range of music. He works hard, but you know, it's always working hard on what he loves. Um, and he just seems like a really humble, nice guy. Like he's, he's like my number one collaboration. I'd love to have him like creative direct a collection or something. That would be sick. Yeah. Brother, thank you so much for coming over. Thanks You're for amazing. Me. I can't believe we're going to be still together for a couple of days. Yeah, so I'm stoked good for this adventures. weekend. Yeah. Anything else that you would love to add? No, I just, I think you've just opened my world with this coffee and mezcal <laughs> thing. <laughs> it had some psilocybin in it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, know, I like that. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Coffee and mezcal and psilocybin. That would work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, brother. Thank you. Gracias y nos vemos a la próxima.